we can see that various schools emphasize the same principles. They simply use different forms to describe it. Therefore, since all lead to the same goal, all methods are equal, and no one method is better than another. We can choose whichever method best fits our manner of living and level of achievement and understanding. The most important point is to concentrate on just one method. The more methods we try to follow, the more confused we become. The more confused we are, the more difficult it is to succeed. This is very important as samadhi or deep concentration is the key to success in our learning and cultivation. We explain these as the three learnings of precepts or self-discipline, deep concentration, and wisdom. Self-discipline leads to deep concentration. Deep concentration leads to wisdom. Therefore, intuitive wisdom arises from deep concentration. This deep concentration is our self-nature and it is called the Great Samadhi, Brightness Cloud. Of the ten brightness clouds, the first five explain fundamental principles and the latter five describe the methods. The fundamental principles are the basis of Buddha Shakyamuni's teachings. The following are the five methods. First is the great auspicious brightness cloud. What does auspicious mean? For most of us, auspicious means to get what we deserve. If we obtain what we do not observe, it is not auspicious. The meaning of auspicious in Buddhism is much more profound. Throughout the universal existence, nothing is beyond our knowledge and experience. This is great auspiciousness. For example, when we are mindful of Buddha Amitabha and vow to be born into the Western Pure Land, we will attain birth into the Western Pure Land. If we vow to be born into the flower adornment world, we will attain the stage of awakening of our Akana Buddha. This is the original meaning of auspicious. In our world, Buddha Shakyamuni taught different methods for different levels of understanding, and this is the utmost auspiciousness. First, the Buddha's teachings never contradict the truth of life and the universe. Second, the Buddha always adopted his teachings to meet the audience's needs. His teachings would be a failure if they proved to be incomprehensible to the listeners or if they were too simple and boring. Neither of these would be auspicious. Therefore, 
the appropriate teaching is most auspicious. The Buddha conveys all that he wishes. We hear all that we can understand and absorb. This is the utmost, the greatest, the perfect auspiciousness. Nowadays, people pursue wealth, knowledge, health, and long life. This is called good fortune. If the Buddha asks us to learn and practice Buddhism, but we do not receive what he said we would, then we will reject the teachings. Why? If we cannot get what we wish for now, how can we believe we will receive what is promised to us in the next life? It is all too distant and uncertain. When will we get to enjoy the promised great reward? However, if we can receive benefits now, we will be much more likely to believe in the promise of even greater rewards in the future. By truly practicing Buddhism, we will receive all that we wish for. This is similar to a tree blossoming and bearing fruit. Only when we see the beautiful blossoms will we believe that there will be fruit. If the flower does not blossom, how can we believe there will be fruit? Therefore, we have the great good fortune brightness cloud following the great auspicious brightness cloud. We must cultivate the cause before we can receive the result. The next guiding principle is represented by the great merit brightness cloud. All Buddhas spent a long time, 100 eons, cultivating good fortune after attaining Buddhahood. Why? A Buddha cannot help sentient beings if he himself does not have great good fortune. People will not believe in a teacher who talks of it, but obviously lacks it. However, when the teacher has it and explains that it comes from cultivation, then people will listen and follow his or her teachings. Therefore, only if the teacher has great good fortune and virtue in addition to wisdom, can he or she help sentient beings? Thus, the Buddha taught us to cultivate both good fortune and wisdom. However, good fortune is different from merit and that merit is the one that helps us to transcend the cycle of birth and death. We accumulate merit by practicing the three learnings of self-discipline, deep concentration, and wisdom. In our practice, we need to rely on the next principle of the Great Refuge Brightness Cloud. 
This is not what is usually thought of as taking refuge in the triple jewels of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Rather, it is to return to and rely upon the triple jewels, the great perfection of our true self-nature. The great brightness cloud, the great praise brightness cloud, symbolizes educating others about Buddhism, praising the perfect and infinite merits and virtues of the self-nature. What does Buddhism teach us to attain our perfect self-nature? Zen Buddhism often says that we should search for the original state of our perfect self-nature. In summary, Buddha Shakyamuni emitted light at the beginning of the Earth Treasure Sutra. This light has many infinite, boundless meanings, more than the ten brightness clouds discussed. The first five brightness clouds are the great perfection of self-nature. And the last five are the function of self-nature. These ten comprise the basis of the Buddha's teachings and are to be found in many sutras, often represented by emissions of light. Many people read of the brightness clouds without any real understanding of the profound meanings within. Not only this sutra, but also all sutras start and flow from the great perfection. We will benefit much more from reading sutras once we understand these representations. The sequence of practice in Mahayana Buddhism is represented in China by the four great bodhisattvas, Ditsang, Earth Treasure, Bodhisattva of Jueyhua Mountain, Guanyin, Great Compassion Bodhisattva of Putol Mountain, Wenshu Shuli, Manjushri Bodhisattva of Utai Mountain, and Pu Xian, Universal Worthy Bodhisattva of Amei Mountain. Earth treasure means stored treasure of the great Mother Earth, which represents our mind. Without the Earth, nothing could survive. So the Buddha used the earth as a metaphor for our mind, which is the great perfection. It encompasses infinite compassion, wisdom, intuitive wisdom, auspiciousness, good fortune, merit, and virtue. Therefore, all that the Buddha taught is in the sutras, is infinite, is the great perfection. Understanding this will enable us to find the boundless meanings within. The Earth Treasure Sutra explains that we begin our learning and practice by being filial to our parents and respectful to our teachers and elders. 
Buddhism is an education of honoring teachers and revering their teachings, which is based on the foundation of filial piety. How can we expect a person who is not filial to his or her parents to respect his or her teachers? A teacher, regardless of learning and capabilities, cannot impart knowledge to a student who does not respect or listen to them. Therefore, only when we honor teachers and revere their teachings can we truly succeed in our learning of Buddhism. The original vow of Earth Treasure Bodhisattva Sutra is the Sutra of Filial Piety, which is the very heart of the Great Perfection. All other perfections arise from it. From here, we extend this loving and caring for parents to respecting teachers and elders. We keep expanding from here until we respect and care for all sentient beings without discrimination or attachment. This is the enhancement and the extension of earth treasure bodhisattva and is the teaching of Guan Yin Bodhisattva. Therefore, without filial piety, there would be no great compassion. This is similar to building a house. The second floor must be built upon the first floor. In being filial to our parents and showing compassion for all other beings, we should not use emotion. Rather, we need to base this compassion on rationale and wisdom. Only in this way can we attain positive results. Next is the third Bodhisattva, Manjusri, who symbolizes wisdom, and universal worthy Bodhisattva, who symbolizes the practice of filial piety, respect, compassion, and wisdom in our daily lives. If we practice these principles while interacting with others, matters, and objects, then we ourselves are universal worthy bodhisattva. The teachings of universal worthy bodhisattva are perfect. As the Flower Adornment Sutra tells us, we cannot attain Buddhahood if we do not follow his teachings. Why? This Bodhisattva is perfect in every thought, word, and deed. Without true wisdom, the great vow of universal worthy Bodhisattva cannot be fulfilled. These four great Bodhisattvas exemplify this understanding and represent the perfection of Mahayana Buddhism. Therefore, from Earth Treasure Bodhisattva, we learn filial piety and respect. From Guan Yin Bodhisattva, we learn great compassion. From Manjusri Bodhisattva, 
we learn great wisdom. And from universal worthy Bodhisattva, we learn the great vows and conduct. Buddha Shakyamuni used innumerable methods to correspond with the level of attainment of his listeners. However, regardless of the particular method, he never deviated from the great perfection. In other words, all his teachings arose from the self-nature. Consequently, all methods are equal. It is like the harmony between the leading role and the supporting roles in the Flower Adornment Sutra. If Buddha Shakyamuni is the leading role, then all other Buddhas are the supporting roles. When Buddha Amitabha is the leading role, then Buddha Varakana will be the supporting role. Any Buddha can take the leading role. Harmonious cooperation between the roles is also found among the Bodhisattvas. If we regard Guan Yin Bodhisattva as the leading role in our learning of Buddhism, then all the others, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, are the supporting roles. If Earth Treasure Bodhisattva takes the leading role, then Guan Yin Bodhisattva and others take the supporting roles. This principle applies to sutras as well. When we choose the Infinite Life Sutra as our primary sutra, then all other sutras become secondary. If we take the Diamond Sutra as the primary, then the Infinite Life Sutra and the Flower Adornment Sutra become the secondary. All bodhisattvas and all sutras are equal in nature. Whichever primary method is chosen, it is praised as number one. However, saying that a certain method is number one does not mean that the others are less important or less effective. If we forget this, then we commit a serious offense. What offense? That of praising ourselves and belittling others. Consider the origin of the Visualization Sutra. When Queen Videhi suffered from overwhelming fortune, from overwhelming family misfortune, she bitterly said to Buddha Shakyamuni that life was filled with suffering. And she asked if there was not a place without suffering and said that she wished to live in such a world. By applying his supernatural abilities, Buddha Shakyamuni displayed for the Queen all the worlds of all the Buddhas in the universe. She vowed to be born into Buddha Amitabha's Western Pure Land, the world of ultimate bliss, and requested that Buddha Shakyamuni teach her how to accomplish this. He taught her how to practice the three conditions, explaining that they were the fundamental causes of attaining Buddhahood. 
for the Buddhas of the past, present, and future had all used the three conditions. Therefore, they are a crucial part and a foundation of our practice. The three conditions are the basis of Buddhism and are crucial in our attainment of Buddhahood. To be a virtuous person, it is necessary to first follow the three conditions. In the sutras, we often see the phrase, good men and good women. What are the requirements for being good? Meeting each of the eleven principles contained in the three conditions. Thus, we will see that the requirements are stringent. Good men and women in the human and heaven realms need only meet the first condition. Theravada students, sutras, only require practitioners to fulfill the first and second conditions. But for Mahayana practitioners, good men and women must meet all three conditions. As we see in Mahayana Sutras such as the Earth Treasure Sutra and the Infinite Life Sutra, it is to live our lives in accordance with these eleven principles. Failure to satisfy any one of these principles would prohibit a person from being considered good. Regardless of what the Buddha taught, the methods of learning and cultivation, or the reality of life and the universe, all accord with the three conditions. All accord with the great perfection. The eleven principles of the three conditions are likewise perfect in every word. The first condition concerns the great good fortune required to be a human or heavenly being and includes being filial to our parents, being respectful to our teachers and elders, being compassionate and not killing any living beings, and following the ten good conducts. Consider the first and second principles of being filial to our parents and respecting teachers and elders. The Chinese character for filial piety, Xiao, is comprised of two parts. The top part, old, means the previous generations, and the bottom part, children, means the future generations. This demonstrates that the previous generations and the future generations are one. They are one rather than two. In our modern world, the existence of the generation gap has resulted in parents and children being two instead of one. This gap contradicts the principle of filial piety, which has no generation gap. The past had its own past. The future will have its own future. The past had no beginning, and the future will have no end. They are one. 
Filial piety reaches beyond time and extends throughout the universe. In other words, it encompasses the entire universe. Who can practice the principle of filial piety to perfection? Only a Buddha can do so. Without having attained Buddhahood, we cannot achieve the great perfection in practicing filial piety. Filial piety has profound meanings in Buddhism. It means to take care of parents mentally, physically, and to fulfill their wishes. To further extend and enhance our respect and care for our parents, we have compassion for all beings in this world. As stated in a precepts, precept sutra, all men are my father, all women are my mother. This is broadening the mind of filial piety so that it encompasses all beings in the universe, in the past, present, and future. Mahayana teachings are based on the principle of filial piety, for without it, there would be no principle of respecting teachers. It is illogical that we are not filial to our parents, yet respectful to our teachers. We could have ulterior motives, for example, flattering the teacher to obtain a better grade. Filial piety and respect go together. At the same time that we are filial to our parents, we also elevate that filial piety to being respectful to our teachers. Only when we realize this truth will we truly appreciate the principle of filial piety. The Earth Treasure Sutra is the Buddha's teaching of filial piety. For only when we treat our parents with such respect can we uncover the infinite treasure within our own self-nature. Being filial towards our parents is a virtue of our self-nature. Only virtuous acts can uncover our self-nature. It is the first and most fundamental principle of the three conditions. The Chinese respect ancestors, even though they are distant to them by hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of years. They memorialize them on important festivals. Why? Their ancestors and they are one entity. There is no gap between them. Sincerely memorializing our ancestors corresponds with our self-nature. If we remember and respect our ancestors, we will certainly be filial to our parents. When we are filial towards our parents, it naturally follows that we will respect our teachers. When we disappoint our parents 
by not respecting teachers, not following their instructions, and not studying hard, we violate the principle of filial piety. Also, siblings would do well to live in harmony. Not getting along with brothers and sisters will cause parents to worry, thus violating the principle of filial piety. By getting along with others at work, meeting responsibilities, and abiding by laws, we will not cause our parents to worry. Thus, we will accord with the principle of filial piety. These are a true perfection of virtue. Buddha Shakyamuni taught us to begin our learning from here. He is our original teacher from 3,000 years ago. If we respect a teacher from this far in the past, how can we not respect our current teachers? When we pay respect to an image of the Buddha, we are not worshiping him. We pay respect to the image as a representation of our original teacher. And therefore, we pay our debt of gratitude to him. This is why the followers of the Buddha respect the Buddha's images, as well as memorial tablets of ancestors. This practice has a far-reaching and widespread educational significance, for at the sight of them we remember our obligation of caring for and respecting our parents, teachers, and elders. The Earth Treasure Sutra tells us about compassion after explaining the great perfection. Compassion is the third principle of the three conditions. Compassion is also a virtue of self-nature and is crucial to our practice. When the virtue of filial piety and respect for parents and teachers is expanded, it becomes compassion. Compassion includes not killing any living being. This statement has profound meanings. Without a thorough comprehension of Earth Treasure Sutra, we cannot understand the true meaning behind not killing any living being. Of all bad karmas, that of killing is the worst. Why? All living beings have the natural instinct of fearing and evading death. Although killing is the direct retribution of the victim who killed the present killer in a previous lifetime, the current victim does not know this. He or she would not think that they killed this present victim. They killed this person now, so this person is killing me now. If only the victim could understand this, there would be no anger at the retribution. Instead, the present victim would think, you are killing me now. 
I will kill you next. This vengeance will be repeated in the endless cycle of birth and death, and the mutual hatred will grow stronger and stronger. This is the most terrible of all offenses and is why we need so urgently to practice compassion for all beings. There are infinite ways to practice compassion, but in the three conditions, the Buddha particularly stressed not killing any living being. In other words, not killing is the ultimate act of being filial towards our parents and, dis and respectful towards our teachers and elders. In other words, killing is the ultimate act of unfiliality and disrespect. The Buddha taught the basic five precepts, and the first of these is also the first of the ten good conducts. Do not kill. Continuing to kill is to completely disregard this teaching and is an ultimate act of disrespect. This respect is tantamount to being unfilial to our parents. Consequently, if we ignore these instructions and kill, we are neither compassionate nor filial. The fourth principle is following the ten good conducts, which are the good behavior to be found in many cultures and religions throughout the world. Buddha Shakyamuni told us that if we practice these good conducts, we would not fall into the three bad realms. Instead, we would likely be to be born into the heaven realms if we practice these good conducts diligently. If we achieve the deep concentration along with the four immeasurable hearts of loving kindness, compassion, joy, and letting go, we will rise to an even higher level of the heavens, the heaven of form and the heaven of formless. The Buddha groups the ten good conducts into three major categories, physical, verbal, and mental. Physically, we are prohibited from killing, stealing, and committing sexual misconduct. The last prohibition is for laypersons. For monks and nuns, this prohibition is to eradicate all sexual inclinations. Regardless of their good deeds or their ability in deep concentration. Those who have sexual desires can only rise as far as the heaven of desire. This heaven has six levels. The higher we rise, the lighter these desires. A person who sincerely cultivates and has thus attained even the lowest level of deep concentration would be able to suppress sexual desires. At this level, the five desires of wealth, lust, fame, 
food or drink and sleep would not arise. Although the desires are not completely eradicated, they can be suppressed by deep concentration. Only the one who can resist temptations of desire can attain this state and thus be born into the heavens above the first level meditation heaven. Understanding this explains why attainment throughout this process is so difficult. When we are attempting to practice, we can ask ourselves, can I resist the five desires of wealth, lust, fame, food or drink, and sleep? If we yield to temptation, we will not be able to rise to this level of heaven. The second good conduct is to not steal. For instance, some people like to evade paying their income taxes. This is equivalent to stealing money from the whole country. And the retribution from this is much more serious than stealing private property. When we steal one person's private property, we only have a debt to that one person. But if we steal the property of an entire country, we have a hopelessly insurmountable task, insurmountable debt, because we then have stolen from and subsequently owe every taxpayer. For example, the United States has a population of well over 200 million people. 200 million creditors. Just imagine the consequences. Therefore, a sincere practitioner must be a law-abiding person devoted to meeting public responsibilities. One who does not violate the good deeds of no killing, stealing, or sexual misconduct is said to be proper in physical conduct. There are four verbal good deeds. No lying, abusive language, bearing tales, and seductive words. First, do not lie. To lie is to cheat deliberately. It is dishonesty. Second, do not make rude or abusive remarks. Those who have this bad habit speak with no sense of propriety. Their words can be very irritating and very harmful. Third, do not talk about others behind their back, for this sows discord among people. A person says to Sam, Tom has said something bad about you. And then this person says to Tom, Sam has said something bad about you. Whether this person does so deliberately or unintentionally, he is bearing tales and gossiping. In our society, many people do this unintentionally. At times, so many people participate in this that the subject becomes distorted beyond recognition. A well-meant message or remark may become just the opposite after everyone who passes it 
adds or omits something. This can cause serious consequences, ranging from discord among individuals to war among countries. Fourth, do not use seductive words. These can sound very sweet and enticing, but often conceal bad intentions. Just look at many of today's singers, movie stars, and performers. They sound beautiful and look good. But what they are teaching people to do is to lie, to steal, to kill. Fifth, do not commit sexual misconduct. Practice chastity before as well as after marriage. Finally, there are three mental good conducts. No greed, anger, or ignorance. Greed includes being stingy, reluctant to give of our belongings, our knowledge to help others. This can become the greatest obstacle to overcome in our practice. The Buddha taught giving as a way to eradicate our greed. Some practitioners are able to resist worldly temptations. However, they cannot resist the desire to learn many methods of practice. So they may not truly have rid themselves of their greed. The Buddha taught us to let go of all desires and greed. He did not ask us to turn to new objects of our greed. In the past, we sought worldly joys. Now we seek and attach to Buddha knowledge. The mind of greed is still there. Therefore, whether for worldly life or for Buddhist knowledge, we would do well not to be greedy. Greed is the source of all misdeeds and wrongdoings. Greed leads to resentment and anger. Why? We become resentful and angry when our greed is not satisfied. And this brings about immense worries and afflictions. Greed is the cause of the karma that results in our being born into the hungry ghost realms. By failing to rid ourselves of the resentment and anger caused by greed, we can be born into the hell realms. Ignorance, having no wisdom, is the cause of our being born into the animal realm. In both worldly teachings and in Buddhism, there is truth and falsehood, justice and injustice, right and wrong, good and bad. An ignorant person cannot tell the difference between them. He or she often confuses false and true, good and bad. Whether this is done intentionally or unintentionally, this person is ignorant. The three poisons are the biggest obstacles to our attainment of enlightenment. Buddhism 
especially the Zen school, advocates starting our practice from the root, the mind. To start from this root, we need to sever our greed, anger, and ignorance. These three physical, four verbal, and three mental deeds comprise the ten good conducts. If we are filio too and care for our parents, respect and serve our teachers and elders, and are compassionate without any killing, and practice the ten good conducts, we will be regarded as good people by society. However, in the Buddhist sense, we are still not considered good men and good women. Thus, it is not easy for us to achieve even the basic standards.